So we now turn to the representation theory of SU3, the group of special unitary 3x3 three three matrices. So this will have full applications to the theory of quarks, baryons, and mesons and things. And the good news is it's not that much harder than SU2. The even better news is there's a whole class of groups called semi-simple groups for which the representation theory is also very similar to the representation theory of SU3. So it's, uh, it's going to be a very instructive example to work out in detail. Now when we studied SU2, the key thing that we did was to introduce the weight diagram. Remember the weight diagram was a way of decomposing the vector space on which we're acting into eigenspaces for the action of the diagonal matrices. Now in SU3, the group of diagonal matrices is slightly bigger. Um, so if we call T the subgroup of diagonal matrices in SU3, this is now actually a copy of U1 times U1. Let's see why. Well, if you're diagonal in SU3, you can be any unit complex number um, on the diagonal in the first and second entries, but then the third entry is determined by the fact your determinant is 1. So we have e to, e to the i theta 1, e to the i theta 2, and e to the minus i theta 1 plus theta 2 on the diagonal, and zeros elsewhere. Okay, so theta 1, theta 2 are real numbers, but really they, they go between 0 and 2 pi. Okay, so T here stands for torus, because like U1 is like a circle, and a circle times a circle is a, is a torus. Imagine taking a circle and rotating it around in a circle, you get a torus. And more generally, for more general groups, we're going to have an analog of this group T called a maximal torus. So here is the important lemma that gives us our weight space decomposition. So if R from SU3 to GLV is a complex representation, uh, then V splits as a direct sum of weight spaces where the weight spaces are now indexed by two integers, say K and L, uh, which correspond to the two factors in U1 times U1. One of these factors is e to the i theta 1, the other is e to the i theta 2. So in other words, WKL is the set of vectors V in V, such that this diagonal matrix, um, I should really come up with a name for this. I'm going to call this D theta 1 theta 2. Right, this diagonal matrix e to the i theta 1, e to the i theta 2, e to the minus i theta 1 plus theta 2. So how is WKL defined? It's defined to be the set of V such that R of this diagonal matrix d theta 1 theta 2 of V equals e to the i k theta 1 plus L theta 2 of V. So for SU2, our torus was just a copy of U1. We only had theta 1. Our diagonal matrix was just e to the i theta 1, e to the minus i theta 1. We only needed one integer k to describe the uh, weight space decomposition. So k and l are going to be integers. Now we need two integers. And um, rather than prove this lemma immediately, I'm going to work out some examples so you can see what the weight diagrams look like. So rather than the weight diagrams being sequences of dots drawn along a line, you know, indexed by their position in the, in the integers, we're now going to have two dimensional diagrams in the plane. So let's do an example. Let's take C3, the standard representation of SU3. This is now three dimensional because they're three by three matrices. So this has basis E1, E2, E3, the usual basis vectors uh, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. 
Uh, what are the weights of these vectors under this uh, representation? Well, it's the standard representation. So, you know, R D theta one theta two is just this diagonal matrix e to the i theta one e to the i theta two e to the minus i theta one plus theta two. So e one transforms under this like uh, e to the i theta one e one. All right, it, the first basis vector maps to e to the i theta one times e one. Second basis vector maps to e to the i theta two e two, and the third basis vector maps to e to the minus i theta one plus theta two e three. So, in other words, the weight spaces are going to be w one zero corresponding to this e one, so this is spanned by e one. And so we have k equals 1, l equals 0, uh, w, 0, 1, that is spanned by e2, because there's just a theta 2, there's no theta 1, and w, minus 1, minus 1, corresponding to the fact that theta 1 and theta 2 uh, occur with a minus sign in, in the exponent here, uh, and that's spanned by e3. So those are the weight spaces. How are we going to draw them? Well. The obvious thing would be to just draw an integer grid and you know put points at you know one zero zero one and minus one minus one like this and that would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do but somehow this triangle I've got here is not an equilateral triangle and I don't like that because uh, in some sense we've destroyed a lot of the symmetry in the situation by choosing the first and second columns here to be sort of main coordinates on our group right we could have we could have had like e to the minus i theta 2 plus theta 3 e to the i theta 2 e to the i theta 3 that would be another perfectly valid choice and uh, we, we sort of made a choice and broke some symmetry here and that's why this triangle is not an equilateral triangle so I'm going to draw the diagram slightly differently in a way that restores that symmetry so here's what I'm going to do the k axis is going to go horizontally, just like in this picture, but the l axis, remember the k and the l are the, these two uh, weights, the l axis is going to be at 120 degrees. It's going to go up like this. So 1, 0 is going to be here, 0, 1 is going to be up here, 1 along the l axis. And minus one minus one is actually going to be down here. You go uh, minus one along the k axis and then minus one down the l axis to there. Okay, so actually these vertices are now, well, if my drawing was slightly better, these would be the vertices of an equilateral triangle. Okay, so this is the origin, and these are at the sort of the uh, cube roots of unity as it were. Okay so that's my weight diagram for the standard representation of SU3. So let's do another example. I want to do sim2 of the standard representation. So sim2 means quadratic polynomials in the elements of C3. So a basis for this will be uh, polynomials like E1 squared, that is E1 tends to E1, uh, e1 e2 which stands for e1 tensor e2 plus e2 tensor e1 uh, e1 e3 e2 squared e2 e3 and uh, e3 squared okay so there's six uh, basis elements how do they transform under uh, this diagonal matrix d theta 1 theta 2 in this representation well, e1 itself transforms as e to the i theta 1 e2. So if I square it, I just end up with e to the i 2 theta 1 e1 squared. Uh, e1 e2, well, each of them transforms like e to the i theta 1 e to the i theta 2. So the product transforms like e to the i theta 1 plus theta 2 e1 e2. 
e3 goes like e to the minus i theta 1 plus theta 2. If I multiply that with e1, that transforms like e to the i theta 1. So the theta 1s cancel. I end up with e to the minus i theta 2 e1 e3. e2 squared goes like e to the uh, i 2 theta 2 e2 squared. E2, E3, similar to E1, E3, goes like E to the minus I theta 1, E2, E3. And E3 squared goes like E to the minus I 2 theta 1 plus theta 2, E3 squared. So what are K and L, if I write them as a vector for each of these? In the first one, K is 2 and L is 0. There's 2 theta 1s and no theta 2s. Then we get 1, 1, 0, minus 1, uh, 0, 2, minus 1, 0, and lastly, minus 2, minus 2. So let's draw those in my uh, lattice of weights. So remember the k-axis is going horizontally, the l-axis is at 120 degrees to the k-axis. And I'm also going to draw in the k equals l line, which is then at 60 degrees to both of those. Okay, so here are some integer points. Here's uh, 1, 0. Here's 2, 0. That's one of my weights, so let's do it in red. Here's uh, 1, 1. I'll do that one in red as well. Here's 0, 1, and here in red is uh, 0, 2. So which ones have I done? I've done this one, this one, and this one. What's left, I've got to do uh, 0, minus 1. That's going to be um, down here. I've got to do minus 1, 0. That's going to be over here. And I've got to do minus 2, minus 2, which is going to be way down here. Because minus 1, minus 1 is there. OK, so let's uh, just join those dots up and see what we get. We get a triangle. And again, my drawing is not great, but it's an equilateral triangle if you draw it accurately. It's got six points, three vertices and three on the sort of midpoints. And those are my weight spaces. So this is sim. Oops. Sim 2 C3 weight diagram. So it turns out the kinds of diagrams I'm going to get for representations of SU3 will be triangles and hexagons. Okay, let's prove the lemma so that we can decompose our representation of SU3 into these weight spaces indexed by pairs of integers. Okay, so um, proof of lemma. First of all, I'm going to consider the subgroup T1 consisting of the matrices D theta 1 0. In other words, that's e to the i theta 1 uh, 1 e to the minus i theta 1 in, uh, in T. Right, just where theta 2 is 0. So that is isomorphic to U1. And certainly this subgroup acts on my representation V. So V decomposes into weight spaces for this copy of U1. In other words, I can write V as a direct sum of UKs, where each UK is the set of V in V, such that uh, R of D theta 1, 0, of v equals e to the i k theta 1 v for all theta 1. Okay, so I can just restrict attention to one of the two factors of u1 times u1 and take weight spaces with respect to that. So the claim is that uh, if I consider t2, which is the set of matrices d 0 theta 2, in other words, I let theta 1 
be zero and just keep the theta two e to the i theta two and e to the minus i theta two on the diagonal. This subgroup preserves each uk. In other words, if I take a vector in uk, I apply one of these matrices in the representation, I stay inside uk. So this implies the, the lemma, I'll, I'll prove the claim in a second, because what we now get is uh, each uk is a direct sum of pieces, which I'm going to call WL, uh, KL, where WKL is the set of vectors in UK, so they already transform in the right way for theta 1, such that uh, R D 0 theta 2 V uh, equals E to the I L theta 2 V. So putting these two things together, they transform in the right way under theta 1 and under theta 2. Therefore, they transform in the right way under combinations of theta 1, theta 2. So let's prove the claim. We need to show that this copy of U1 preserves the weight spaces of the previous copy of U1. Well, what does it mean to be inside U1? It means V is an eigenvector for R d theta 0, uh, d theta 1 0, uh, with eigenvalue e to the i k, uh, k theta 1 for all theta 1. So if v is in u k, then um, r d theta 1 0 v equals e to the i k theta 1 v for all theta 1. What we want to show is that, um, and this, this is if and only if, we want to show that if I apply R D zero theta two to V, this is still in UK if V is in UK. So we're going to assume this equation here, that V is in UK, and then we're going to prove that um, R D theta one zero apply to this guy, R D zero theta two V equals E to the I K theta one of R D zero theta two V. Because that's telling us that this guy, R D theta zero, uh, D zero theta two V is in uh, UK. Okay, so how do we show this? Well, let's just compute the left-hand side. Fortunately, uh, d theta one zero and d zero theta two are diagonal matrices. Diagonal matrices commute with one another, so we get d theta one zero d zero theta two equals d zero theta two d theta one zero. So if I apply the representation to both sides, I you know I get the same thing because the representation just um, sort of distributes into the product. So I get R D theta one zero R D zero theta two equals R D zero theta two R D theta one zero. So this left hand side, I can just move the R D zero theta two before the other matrix. Um, and I get, uh, I'm just gonna copy this because it takes me so long to write it out. This left hand side um, equals what I get by switching the two matrices. And well, this bit here, R D theta one zero, V equals e to the i k theta 1 v because v is in uk by assumption and this e to the i k theta 1 is just a scalar so I can bring it out the front and I get e to the i k theta 1 times r d 0 theta 2 v and there that thing is again 
that I've underlined on the left hand side. So this is showing that R D zero theta two V is in UK. Okay, so that proves the claim. And this argument you can see doesn't really use the fact that you know this is a two-dimensional torus. This would work for any abelian group, right? Any u1 times u1 times u1. It doesn't need to be two copies of u1. So this works much more generally than for SU3. So in general, just going up, if our torus is u1 times u1 times u1 times u1 some number of times, my weight space decomposition is going to be into weight spaces indexed by integers, one integer for every factor of, of u1 times u1 times u1. So in this case, we get two integers. So for example, for SU4, you're going to have u1 times u1 times u1, and your weight diagrams are going to be three-dimensional diagrams, three-dimensional polyhedra. SU5, you're going to get four-dimensional polyhedra etc. cetera. 